I came across this post that was shared by Jeffrey Tucker, the well-known economist. Uh, he's well-known in the libertarian slash anarcho-capitalist circles. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and read this. If you think it's boring if I read the post, let me know. I don't mind. Give me some feedback. Um, I just know this is a good post. And, uh, of course, as always, I will link to it. In the description below, if you're on YouTube, if you're on Facebook or something, you know, check me out on YouTube. Most governors in the United States have shut down their economies, requiring people to shelter in place. The measures are destroying one of the world's strongest economies before our very eyes. We're also relying on the very same governments that spend many weeks sending contradictory messages, blocking testing, and generally being ill-prepared also to manage us out of this mess. Quote, For a family sitting around the dinner table tonight, said Nancy <clears throat> something, a spokesperson for the CDC on January 17th, this is not something that they generally need to worry about. Anthony Fauci said on January 27th that, quote, the American people should not be worried or frightened by this. It is very, very low risk to the United States. Boy, do things change quick in 2020. The narrative changed less than two months later and panic ensued. The lockdown came. Since then, more than 16 million workers, over 10% of the labor force, have filed for unemployment benefits. Most have done so not because they hate their jobs or don't want to work, in parentheses, unlike in typical economic crisis, because there is no demand for their efforts, but because state governments are forcefully preventing them from working. The, ramific uh, the ramifications are astonishing. Travel bans have separated families. The mandatory closings have shattered life plans. Tens of millions of Americans suddenly face wreckage unthinkable just six weeks ago. Everything is being told to adjust to a world in which we lost so much of our control of our life decisions and there's no end in sight. I'm going to try to read a little faster because this is a longer post. And uh, let me know. Let me know if I read too slow, if I read too fast. You want me to comment more? You want me to not do these videos? Let me know, guys. Congress and the president quickly produced one of the most expensive spending bills in history, a bill that tragically will pay tens of millions of workers more to be unemployed than to work. The politicians claim that their spending is stimulus, but it's not and it can't be. A government cannot stimulate production that is that has forbidden. That it has forbidden, sorry. Um, I wanted to point out, this post was uh, made on April 13th. And just as a side note real quick, there's another post that I have right here. Um, and this came out on the 17th. Yep, 17th. And basically what they're saying is that, um, you know, it's basically like the flu. Like the death rate is extremely low. Um, you know, as we get more and more data it looks less and less scary. It becomes more and more clear that the government's kind of overreacted with the response. And and by overreacted, I mean, I'm, that's assuming they even have the power to do this, which in the U.S., at least, they don't have the power, the legal authority to lock everyone down. Now, of course, they will, and they get away with it, but it's unconstitutional. That's another video that I made. I don't want to digress too much. Um, I'll try to remember to link to this one as well, but, uh, you know, I'm just showing that as more and more time goes by, it's becoming more and more apparent that this was all hysteria. It was, you know, I never bought into it from the beginning. I knew it was exaggerated from the beginning because, you know, it's... You know, by the time you have a million cases and then, you know, the, the death rate is super low and the tests aren't accurate and all this other stuff. You know, there's just, there was enough evidence to show that this was not a serious crisis from the get-go. And then when the um, response 
resembled the New World Order. Basically, it perfectly landed like a puzzle piece. Just boom. Landed right on the puzzle, right in the spot. It was a little suspicious to me. So that's why I did the documentary Pan Deception. It's also on my YouTube channel. And I basically outlined that. And I've been getting a lot of good feedback from it. So make sure to check that out if you haven't already. Um, also, while we're here, one last thing. Please give me a like. And if you want to see future videos, check out my other videos. If you want to be notified when I create a new video, not only subscribe, but hit that bell icon so you'll be notified because I'm trying to stay on the pulse here and you want to um, also because things are moving very fast and I'm trying to bring the most important news and stuff. All right, so let's go. Congress and the president quickly produced one of the most expensive spending bills in history. Oh, I already read that part. The only way to stimulate the economy is to liberate it. The people, all of us, need emancipation from lockdown, and we need it now. And this is basically a post to kind of uh, make the case for ending the shutdown, which, by the way, I just attended a protest today with a buddy and, here in Orlando. It's on my um, YouTube channel. So now I have two of them from two different protests here in Orlando, basically asking the government to end the lockdown and um, this is just a post, you know, making the case for it. And you let me know what you think after this, after you watch the entire video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Many people fear the consequences of letting tens of millions of people go back to work. I'm afraid, but we can't continue as we are. Some say that we need to discuss when to free up the economy. No, we needed to discuss it long ago. The time for discussion has passed. We are surrounded by wreckage. It should not last one more day. Those who think discussion is needed before we take such a bold step should answer this. How much public discussion was there before March 16th when San Francisco Mayor London Breed in what she called a defining moment shut down most of San Francisco's economy. Days later, did the county governments of California discuss with their citizens whether to impose sheltering in place? California's governor, New York's governor, most of the other governors? No, nor was there a debate or much consultation on the White House's sudden and shocking bans of international travel that have trapped possibly more than 100,000 American students abroad, forcibly separated from their families. No. These leaders just did it. Why did they do it? This will be debated for many years, hence. We hear reasons. This virus, we are told, has unusual characteristics that required it. Politicians are risk-averse and feared not acting. Media howling played a big role in hyping and misrepresenting the predictive models. The public saw reports of large-scale death in certain locations. The uncertainties drove panic and extreme response, a perfect storm of all the above. Regardless of the myriad of factors, we need to reverse it. The government officials base their decisions on a model of a disease that neither nor we, they or we, fully understood. We know more now than we did even a few weeks ago, but not enough to justify these egregious, egregious, I can't even say it right now, policies. As for the disease itself, we're pretty sure that social distancing works to slow the, slow the spread, but most state governments didn't give voluntary social distancing more than a week to work. Could the power of citizens' imaginations be unleashed to produce sufficiently effective social distancing at lower cost than what governments mandate? I believe so. Federal official Dr. Deborah Burks, I hate putting doctor in front of these clowns' names, but we'll go with it. Um, she's commented on how thrilled she is by widespread American support for social distancing. Yay! Sorry. Yes, of course, people respond well to better information. Well, it's weird because we're get, we have the information now to know that you have a less than 0.1% 1, 1 chance of dying, even if you get it. But people are still responding in panic. 
But anyway, back to the post. That's the whole idea of freedom. People adapt even without coercion. Why did so many governors and mayors, with the encouragement of the White House that reversed its previous position, impose a lockdown? After all, Sweden did not, and they're still doing good, by the way. Neither did Iceland. South Korea maintained an open society. Japan, too, has outperformed in stopping the spread without stopping society. In the U.S., it seems to come down to the predictive models. On March 13th, the CDC projected a high of 1.7 million deaths. Woo! We're nowhere near that. That claim was in retrospect outlandish. Models are as good as the assumptions built into them, but it was just the beginning of policy by projection. The big moment for government officials was March 16th. The Imperial College of London model projected that as many as 2.2 million people in the United States could die from the coronavirus. Worst case. Four days later, the New York Times reported on a Columbia University study with an upward do-nothing scenario of half a million new cases per day, with the usual ambiguity, ambiguity, ambiguity about cases and about whether doing something meant being careful ourselves or coercively shutting down the whole economy. The press loved the worst case scenarios and they landed in every headline, all the better for views and clicks. Without an available test, we had no clarity on the right way forward. The crackdown began. Since that time, you may have noticed that almost weekly, various government officials have scaled down the number of U.S. deaths they expect. Is this because of social distancing? Maybe, but the models far overshot on deaths, even with full social distancing and a lockdown. And by the way, this has links in it too, so check them out. Now even Anthony Fauci of the National Institutes of Health predicts that there will be about 60,000 deaths by August. This number is striking. Why? Because it's virtually equal to the 61,000 U.S. deaths that the CDC attributed to the flu just two seasons ago. Could the newly discovered low risk of COVID-19 explain why Chicago's mayor, Lori Lightfoot, while supporting a ban on haircuts and hairstyling, insisted on getting her own haircut. Yeah, clearly, the people running the show here, they don't practice social distancing. When you watch the daily news briefings, they're all up there shoulder to shoulder. When we do the protests here in Orlando, the cops are all standing next to each other. And, you know, I mean, it's do as I say, not as I do. I'm going to keep reading, guys. I'm sorry. I'm going to go fast, fast as I can. So I'm going to mess up here and there. Throw me a light, guys. I'm working hard over here. <laughs> now we have yet another problem. Misclassification of the cause of death. With so much at stake and possibly a desperate desire to justify what they have done, there is strong incentive for governments and agencies to game the numbers. Dr. Burks made a plain upfront announcement that every death from any cause that tests positive for COVID-19 is now counted as a COVID-19 fatality, which is basically an admission that not even the data can be trusted. To be sure, even when corrected for reality, if fatality rates end up similar to a bad seasonal flu, there are apparent differences between COVID and flu. The speed of transmission, the hotspot pattern of infection, and the length of hospitalizations. But these differences require an intelligent medical response, not upheaval. Many of us are convinced by the preliminary results of social distancing. I told my daughter on Zoom recently that I probably won't shake anyone's hand for the next year. Those who think that Americans newly freed to work would not be careful and not observing what I am. Workers at takeout restaurants wear masks as increasingly their customers do too. People out for walks veer right when someone walks toward them to maintain a six foot distance. A plumber we called wore a mask, as I did when I answered the door. And in what is admittedly a non random sample of over 9,000 adults surveyed in the middle of March, before virtually all the shelter in places were in place, 93% washed their hands more and 89% avoided social gatherings. That won't go away quickly. If we open the economy, some people will be at greater risk from COVID-19, especially the elderly. As of April 10th, 
78% of verifiable deaths that the CDC attributed to COVID-19 were people aged over 65 and older. As an Imperial College London study from March 30th demonstrated, this disease is particularly deadly for one demographic. It kills an estimated 13.4% of patients 80 and older compared to 1.25 of those in their 50s and 0.3 of those in their 40s and so on, right? But, you know, it has to do with your immune system, pre-existing conditions, yada, yada. As for the overall case fatality rate, which is drifting even lower and even lower now since this article has been written, we do not know it because the dearth of testing. It could be many times higher than seasonal flu or perhaps lower. We don't even know how many have had it and recovered. Even now, testing is not widely available, only available for those with symptoms, which necessarily excludes asymptomatic people. I'm kind of skipping a little bit. Being elderly, the vast majority of the victims are not employed outside their homes and can more easily stay sheltered in place if they choose to. The disease has ravaged nurse, ner, uh, nervous, I'm sorry, nursing homes. This demographic and these institutions should, be the, should have been the focus of the concern and resources rather than allowing policies to crush the whole society. Exactly. Let the old people... Stay at home. If you know an old person, bring them food, take care of them or whatever if you want to protect them. But, you know, for people that have... the, I mean, old, the elderly are also more at risk for the flu and pneumonia. So this is nothing new. This is, you know, this is typical. All right? All right, I'm getting towards the bottom. Um, this disease should have been regarded as a medical problem with a medical fix not as an excuse to test out the range of awesome powers of the state to trample freedom. We should stop making the cure worse than the disease. The danger of keeping Americans in lockdown is not speculative. It is clear, present, and large. Here's what one woman posted in a recent discussion on Facebook. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. Is anyone here supporting the lockdowns not getting a paycheck? Anyone here supporting the lockdowns of a single parent that has, hasn't received child support in months? Anyone here is supporting the lockdowns of a business owner that is going to go out of business and lose everything they built and sacrificed for? Anyone here in the middle of trying to buy a house, refinance a house, or just lose their job? Nobody in these positions that I've come across is supporting these draconian lockdowns. During the recession, I lost half, half of my customer base who were small business owners. The ones that survived may not survive this. It's easy to support these things when you're not the one hurting financially. I think that's another good point. I go on, but I'm going to finish up this post, and maybe if you're lucky, you'll get a big rant at the end. Should we go back to the status quo? No. The status quo wasn't so great. The FDA insists that drugs should be proven effective before drug companies are allowed to sell them. As Charles Hooper and I have written, the FDA's required proof of efficacy should be ended. Moreover, People with COVID-19 should be allowed to use any drug that they and their doctors think are worth trying. I believe that. We need to have different... I, think, I don't want to digress too much here, but let me just say this. There are all kinds of different treatment options in alternative medicine, and you know we've had some success with them in other countries. Um, not so much here because you know we, our big pharma controls the country. This is just not sugarcoat that. They're the biggest lobbying group. I mean, you know, they, they control medicine. And, um, you know, I think it should be done voluntarily, as that everything else should be. But, you know, if you are, if you happen to get COVID-19 and you are a fan of alternative medicine, then take part of a study. If you say, hey, look, you know, um, I want to listen to this doctor or this doctor or whatever, you know, basically give the people informed consent and let them choose. If they choose to um, get IV, ozone, or, or vitamin C by a healthcare professional. Let's do it. Let's see how it works. You know, um, Dr. Brownstein, he, uh, I just saw a post. He has treated over 100 patients now, um, and not one of them, 100 patients with COVID-19, not one of them have been hospitalized. So, um, you know, I would imagine uh, these doctors that are using these alternative methods, um, and I talked about a bunch of them in my podcast episode about the coronavirus. So if you go to, um, there's different ways to find it. You know, I've got a YouTube channel. Instead of the Awareness Revolution, it's the Awareness Revolution podcast. So there's two separate channels. And I've got the podcast that is all about the, um, 
coronavirus. Or you can go to my website, theawarenessrevolution.com, and it'll show up if you're watching it around this time. Um, or you can go to theawarenessrevolution.com forward slash iTunes, and that'll take you to my podcast on iTunes. And I go over all different types of treatment methods, and I think people should have the freedom to choose what they want to do. Of course, you know, with giving them informed consent, you know, like they need to be informed of their options, pros and cons, and let them decide. And, um, you know, people like Robert Rowan, uh, who is really uh, famous uh, for being an advocate for ozone therapy, which is extremely effective, particularly against viruses, you know, look into him. R-O-W-A-N. Again, that was mentioned in the first podcast about this all. Um, you know, and he, he strongly believes that this is no problem. Like, this is nothing for ozone therapy. And uh, I think that's the case. Um, so anyway, you know, people need to have other treatment methods because it might be the treatment method that is killing people. If we're treating people in the wrong way, these a lot of these deaths could be from malpractice. You know, by some estimates, the third leading cause of death is medical malpractice. I would consider it the number one cause of death. Um, it depends on how you calculate it. But either way, um, you know, so you can go, um, I don't have a video yet, but there was a doctor, and his name doesn't come to my mind right away, but if you want to know who I'm talking about, let me know in the comments below. And I'll put a link. But there's a doctor from New York who was working in the ICU, and he basically is saying the ventilators are doing more harm than good. They're not helping. They're making the situation work. And he went into all this different detail or whatever, but, you know, what I'm saying is maybe the hospitals, the mainstream medicine, is treating it wrong. And that could be why almost all the people who go on a ventilator actually die on the ventilator because the ventilator is not helping. It's actually killing them. But I digress, all right? Um... For years, doctors were not allowed to charge for telemedicine. That requirement has been relaxed and should stay relaxed. Every state government but Arizona's require people with occupational licenses in one state to get a special license when they move to another state. Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker temporarily loosened the rule for health care professionals, blah, blah. But then in April, we should seize the absurdly high unemployment benefits from the federal stimulation, uh, stimulus legislation. We hear so much about the downside of letting people outside. Let's consider the upside. We get to live our lives again. Workers will feel productive and useful again. Americans can stop draining their bank accounts just to pay the rent. We can reduce deaths from suicide, drug overdose, and worse. Families can be re reunited. We can get back to ending poverty, which the World Health Organization says is the number one cause of death around the world. Again, you know, the economic impact will kill more people because people die from poverty, so on and so forth. If you don't get that connection, let me know in the comments below. I'll do a video on it, and I'll focus on that. Because I think people are overlooking this. They think that you just care about money, and therefore you don't care about lives. But they don't understand the connection between money and life. Okay? Anyway. Um... If you add up all the suffering and death generated as a secondary effect of the shutdown, we are looking at a carnage that could be in the same ballpark as COVID deaths. Emancipation now could be, in fact, a strategy for minimizing fatalities. It will certainly reduce overall social and economic disaster from the disease and the disastrous policy response. It's time to let us wash our hands and go to work. Austria, Denmark, and the Czech Republic are now opening up. Sweden, South Korea, Japan, and even China have opened. Right now, in the U.S., a thousand politicians are looking for political cover to reverse course. Let someone brave and bold step forward. History will consider that person a hero, a liberator. And let's not forget the fact that so many of us are losing social interaction. Quote, man is, by nature, a social animal, said Aristotle and man. Are we ever seeing how true that is? We are thinking, acting, creative beings. We have the capacity to achieve remarkable things, including responding to the enormous challenges of pandemic disease, but we must be free to do so. Reopen the free society right now. 